We want to start with silver and what led up to Friday's behavior. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vince Lancy, and this is The Silver Fix. I'm recording this at 1023 Monday morning. Let's get going. Uh, we have three topics to talk about that I want to touch on. Silver's path to Friday. A little recap of Friday and what led to it. Uh, a setup for, for buy season. Sell season is over. And a quick Israel-Hamas war update. Uh Geopolitical comments, uh, as told to me from someone in the region, I should sorry, I should say someone in the Far East who has his eye on the Middle East, a geopolitical person. Anyway, let's get going. All right, on the left, you see the agenda for today. On the right, you see the markets. We want to start with silver and what led up to. Friday's behavior. Not a big background, but let's just start with a summary, right? You have to start with a summary before you get into your stories. Three weeks ago, CTAs, small speculative funds, people that don't have a lot of money are over leveraged and are, they trade like hot potatoes. They make money sometimes. They decided that they were going to sell silver and they sold silver. Remember that day with the long wick? That's when it started. Now, they didn't sell it that day. They sold it this day. And they kept selling it all the way down. And they actually sold it on this first down day, this first lower green candle, first big green candle down there. And although I can't prove it yet, I'd, I'd be pretty confident in saying that that was them covering on Friday. Where do we go from here is obviously the next part of that, which will dovetail into sell season being over. All right. First things first, to make sense of what happens. Make this a little bit bigger, stretch it out a little for you. All right. When we ran into this a couple of weeks ago, right? This was a very disappointing candle. I believe I have said, at least I probably didn't say it here because I don't want to get shot. I said I'd be very worried that we go lower after that. And I didn't don't don't get me wrong, I wasn't sure. Uh, but that kind of sucked. All right. But when it went lower. I saw that CTAs and smaller speculative momentum type funds, FOMO, bearish FOMO, uh, was getting into the market. And I said, okay, that's good. This is good timing for the coming buy season. So if we can just hold on to their shorts for another month or so, uh, I, month and a half, ideally, then we should have some really nice boosters or rocket fuel going into December. Boom to the sky, right? Well, these guys couldn't hold on to it for two weeks. There's the first week, there's the second week, and here's the third week. First week, second week, a little bit of a bounce, third week, you know, rocket ship higher. So the good news is the behavioral pattern is the same. Uh, we're in sell season, and during sell season, the bigger players, the long macro funds, the people that say, I'm an investor in silver, and they buy it, or they sell something that they're already long, you know, to reduce their exposure. Those people are out. They're out. They're they're. Uh, I'm not saying they're flat. I'm just saying they're they don't have any new customer money coming in. They're not looking to buy a dip right now. And so because of that, market moves can get exaggerated. It's very much like a thinly traded market. Uh, now the banks are watching everything, and the banks know that the customer business, the bigger customer business, the more important, got silver, um, is on the sidelines. You know, waiting, allocating, getting their end of the year stuff. They do it this early. So the banks are saying, "Well, if I don't have my big business flowing, let's have some fun with the little guys." I kid you not. That's how it works. And so while they don't, uh, I'm not. While they don't. Uh, uh, initiate attacks. They certainly, they don't sell the funds up a river, but they do give them a free paddle. And that's how the banks operate. Yeah, we're, we're not telling you to go up that river, but if you do, this is a really good paddle to use. Have fun, you know, and then they go off. Anyway, so the CTAs piled in and the CTAs piled out. Now, I'm not 100% sure. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second, because I got a little bit of a, 
uh, an education this weekend. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get too 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 long into it. Just put it this way. Let's put a, let's pull a chart up. Okay, this was the situation going into Friday. The dark dark green line is the market, and the green uh, histogram or shaded in area is the open interest of small speculative funds, aka CTAs. Now. They will play sure from time to time, but I'll give you a cursory analysis. See that red rectangle? That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That rarely happens. I don't know what caused it. You don't know what caused it. No one knows what caused it, but they got short very quickly, very bigly. They've been short before. They can be short down here. They can be short. I mean, they've been shorter than this. Don't get me wrong, but to have it be that steep of a decline, that's goofy. I don't know what the reason was, but it happened. Who knows what the reason was? Anyway, and if, if you look at it without my perspective, you'd say, okay, this is very short. And look at where the market is. The market hasn't really capitulated to make them right. You have a lot of new shorts that haven't made a lot of money. On the other hand, you have a lot of shorts down here that did make money, assuming they sold it on the way down. That's how it works. So these people were... Uh, the shortest of the short term, the hottest of the hot money. And on Friday, by the way, this is a beautiful thing. See this peak here and that second little peak? That's just a beautiful thing. Just suffice to say, when the market rallies and someone sells it again and they don't have a lot of money, that's like throwing good money after bad. Anyway, this is before the move on Friday. Now, I don't have the uh, uh, the move after Friday, but that's what happened. That's your rocket fuel. And when you don't have the bigger funds playing, the longs already puked, right? The speculative longs already puked and the macro longs are no longer really playing. The banks can look at the CTAs and go, well, you're the only fish in the tank. I guess I'm going to eat you. And that's what happens. Normally I hold the fund, I hold the banks harmless, but this week I'm going to say that the banks definitely instigated it after a study that I did uh, after last night's class. Okay, so here we go. Here's the goal fix. I just want to let you guys know, all the Arcadia people, I'm going to give um, Chris a a, uh, a special link. 30% off for life, okay? So that's, you know, Chris's gift to you and uh, my gift to Chris. And uh, that's it. Subscribe if you like. By the way, anyone who's uh, already subscribed, send me a message. I'll hook you up. Already paid is what I'm saying. All right. Range versus trend. The market broke out of a range, right? Here's your range. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Broke out. CTAs got in. They saw trend. They FOMO'd it. They sold it. Now we're back in the range, okay? Are you hopeful that it's going higher? Of course you are. Of course I am. Do I think it's going higher? Normally, I would say yes. This time of year, I would say, not this time of year, any other time of year, I would say yes. This time of year, I don't know. And I don't know because all that fresh money that I'm talking about, they're still watching. They're still waiting. They're not going to be so aggressive until maybe November 1st, maybe October 20th. Who knows? But there's a day that they just hit a switch and it goes. And I don't know what that day is. Okay. So CTA behavior going in. I went through that already. All right? I can't spell behavior there. Sell season is over. What do I mean by that? All right. On a monthly basis, well, I'm using the December contract here, so let's just go with spot. On a monthly basis, there is a seasonality. I've mentioned it before. I've mentioned it many times. It is real. It is valid. And it is forever. Well, forever since I've been trading. And the seasonality goes like this. Between, it's an American investor seasonality. Between... November 1st and January 6th, or let's say the first Friday in January, first Friday after the first Friday after New Year's, okay? Between, so I just say January 5th, January 6th. Between, uh, in that time frame, you have uh, registered investment advisors, you have banks, you have clearing houses, you have funds all flush with money for 2024. They have that money and they have to put it to work. And they put it to work by putting it into their recommendations on what to put it into. 
you give me a million dollars, I'm going to put $500,000 into stocks, $300,000 into bonds, $100,000 into oil, $100,000 into precious metals. That's how it works. And these assets fight for allocations. The good assets get more, the bad assets get less, and it becomes a, and then every so often it'll be uh, an asset that's doing poorly, will get a lot because it's really doing poorly. We're at the part of the life cycle of silver and gold, the bigger, bigger trend where uh, they're going to get more. They're going to get more because the world has changed. So give you an example. Every, call it November to January, every November to January, there is fresh money coming into this market, all markets. And how that money gets allocated determines how much higher, if at all, your market goes. Our market is silver. Historically, silver does not get a lot of allocation in this futures market anymore. And that's because the market's been broken. I will say that's in no small part because of the market structure and the fact that you have essentially an oligopoly uh, between small uh, between a small group of players that can control price accidentally or not accidentally. 22 was an example of that. I'm sorry, the, the end of 21, beginning of 22. Everybody started putting their money into uh, gold uh, and silver but during this buy season, but not as much as in previous years because Bitcoin was everyone, oh, Bitcoin's up, Bitcoin's $40,000. And at the end of 21, going into 22, all that money that was being allocated, less money into silver, less money into gold, more money into Bitcoin. And that bubble popped. And last year, we had a very nice, Example of money returning to the king, right? This year, I love this. I, I cannot, I mean, look, I like to throw water on things. Guys, this is where we were last year after the funds puked coming into buy season. This is where we are this year after the funds puked. From a year-to-year -year basis, this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal, which leads me to say that Higher highs, higher lows, there's trend. Uh, it also leads me to say that the buying that we had down here from India, we probably won't have that type of buying again. Don't look for that buying. You're going to have some buying. It'll be American investors. But there'll be other buying, uh, not American, Diwali-based. Uh, uh, I don't know. There's some something going on in China. Uh Wedding season, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, so there's going to be there's going to be other buying in October. There's buying out of India. I'm sure that uh, Diwali season starts, and then before you know it, so so it's kind of like everyone's holiday shopping now. Now, there's one thing that I'm worried about on the silver side, although I'm not really that worried about it. Uh, just be aware. Be aware. That the that the U.S. Mint is going to have new coins coming out, new silver eagles coming out, and you're going to say oh, that could be bearish. No, it won't. It'll be bearish for premiums. It won't be bearish for the market. People will be more aware of it, and they'll buy them quicker, like Costco. Okay, so sell season is over. We're in the car door, the hallway, the on ramp to buy season. Does buy season mean we're going to infinity? No, it just means the chances of us going up are ninety percent. The chances of us going down by the end of it are 10%. How high we go, don't know. But that's how it works. That's what to expect. Israel Hamas war update. I'm going to share with you. Uh, I have opinions. I've given them. But I am by no means a geopolitical expert. My geopolitical knowledge comes from trading oil and precious metals for several decades and talking to players who are geopolitical experts. And so I can parrot them. I can... I have original ideas as well, but understand that they're based on my experience. And every event seems to be a new event these days. And it's, you know, it's harder to pull on previous experience. You know, during the Iraqi war, Iraqi war one, Iraqi war two, that was a different world than now. You know, I'm not saying this world is unmanageable. I'm not saying this world is impossible to figure out, but I am saying it's different. And I perceived some differences that were not making sense. Some of them were pleasant. So for example, gold rallies in a Middle Eastern war. Silver lags. We saw that. But silver usually lags more than this, guys. Silver usually behaves a little bit more like copper, at least for the first week. So that's very good, number one. Number two, 
gold and the dollar rally, right? Safe haven. The dollar usually rallies more than it has in the past. During a crisis, you're a rich Arab dude in the Middle East. You see the bombs coming. You go, you call your broker. You say, fuck it. Put half my money in the silver. Put half my money in the gold. And put the other half in the dollars. That's what you do, right? That's three halves. They have a lot of money. Um, and the dollar and gold compete as safe havens. Then silver gets taken along for the ride, but, you know, slower to react held back by economic shorting held back by people saying oh it's not the it's the you know economic all that other crap all right this year the dollar did not go up as much as gold that's because there's less money going into dollars this won't be a switch you know the death of the dollar dollar dominance ends with a whimper not a bang they're not going to have an announcement it's just going to happen slowly and it'll happen every time I'm a guy in the Middle East, or I'm a guy in China, I'm a guy in the BRICS. I have a treasury. I'm not going to sell. Okay, a lot of them are selling treasuries, but I'm not going to sell my treasuries, right? Because they're my safe haven. I'll wait for maturity, right? And every time a coupon comes, I get my dividend. What do I do with that money? It's in dollars. Well, fuck, I don't need all these dollars anymore. I put half in gold. I put a third into yuan. I put a third into rupees. And those dollars just kind of get orphaned out there. Nobody wants them anymore. And the Fed's got to go, oh, I'm going to raise interest rates to get them back in. They need to stabilize the dollar. And every time a coupon comes due on my treasury, I'm putting that money in the gold. So over time, treasuries will drop, which we've seen. Dollar ownership will drop and gold and silver ownership will rally. That's how it happens. This market will be so much higher over the next five years. I know people are always blowing that smoke up your ass. Uh, tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow's here. It's here. But they're not going to let it go up infinity in a day. They can't do that. You can't have the competition take you out in the headlines. As long as price is broadcast, they will not let gold and silver um, uh, appreciate to their, as long as, I'm sorry, let me say this in a different way. As long as the dollar is the global reserve currency. Treasuries are the global reserve asset. And the U.S. dollar pricing of these commodities is broadcast globally. They cannot afford to have these markets outperform the dollar in times of crisis. That's how it works. Now, why am I saying that? Because last week, China announced that they're no longer broadcasting prices in dollars in China, or at least in one section of China, which means you're no longer seeing the COMEX tape in China. You're no longer seeing an arbitrage based on a COMEX representation. You're seeing their exchange. They're changing exchanges. The world's changing. So when you wake up one day and CNBC has silver in your renminbi, and you can say, okay, let's see what the price of silver does now. Anyway, so that's it. Let me talk about the escalation part. I talked with a friend. He's in Asia, uh, but he's got a lot of uh, Middle Eastern experience. And I'm going to read this conversation to you because I just got it. He's going to bed right now. Uh, I'll see what I can share here. All right. He starts out the conversation. Did Israel bomb the airports in Syria? I'm like, yeah, preemptive war World War III. There's a lot of humor and, and trade talk in here. This is going to get really ugly. Israel lit fire with Hezbollah, Syria, and Iran. He's right. Bombed an airport. Uh, me throwing my little stuff out there. Imagine what a feather in the BRICS cap it would be if they got a peaceful agreement out of this. Let's face it. The, if the U.S. has alienated half of the world and cannot mediate like we once did, Iraq 1, Iraq 2, it actually puts Russia and China in positions to be reasonable. What do they need us for if they can work this out? And, and you know, I do hope they work it out. And he said, that's part of the end game. And we talked about it a little more, and he's saying that anytime they can show the lack of necessity of a hegemon, whether it be military, whether it be negotiating, whether it be dollar, they're going to do that. Now, will they be successful? He's not sure. All right. I don't think Israel had the balls to go with her neighbors like this without some solid U.S. backing. So he does think that we're involved one way or another. I don't agree with him, but he knows more about this than me. The real focus of the transition was Russia, Ukraine. Now that the Middle East is on fire, how 
how the West allocates their resources will be key, right? We're fighting more than one war now. Divide and conquer. Uh, he made a comment about, and I don't know this, Rafi might know this better. He made a comment that uh, Netanyahu had uh, domestic uh, troubles, uh, big ones, my understanding is, and uh, that this uh, initially, these type of people, this geopolitical guy was like, oh, this is them doing uh, Clinton firing rockets at a pharmaceutical company to, to stop people talking about uh, uh, him uh, having sex in the Oval Office. That was their their assumption was uh, whether they did it or let it happen, it was to take the focus off of his domestic problems. And he since changed his mind saying, no, 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 they're too aggressive. We're going after, you know, we're going after uh, Syria. We're bombing Syria. It's almost like in this guy's opinion, and now that I'm saying it out loud, it kind of makes sense. It's almost like Israel did talk to us beforehand and Israel wants to settle it. And the U.S. is like, fine, let's show over, let, let's let everyone see in the world how important our stability is. I don't know, but it's obviously four or five level chess. Well, how is that relevant to our markets? Well, it's relevant this way. If you're looking at headlines and you're looking at news and you're watching a screen, forget price. Listen for the headlines. If a news headline comes out in any way, shape, or form saying we're going to talk, that's bearish. Hot money will get out. We're going to talk on Wednesday. That's bearish. Okay? But as soon as they say something like, regrettably, unfortunately, uh, I'm not going to sit down. Well, then that's bullish. So what am I saying? I'm saying that I don't think you're going to see the lows that we just came off of again for another, at least another, I want to say forever, right? You're not going to see the lows we came off again, I think for the next four or five months. If peace breaks out tomorrow, and we went back down there again, I'd buy that dip. And you know that I'm in the market to buy. I mentioned that before. And so I may have missed my freaking opportunity. Anyway, so that's it. Uh, BB's behavior, U.S. presence, BRICS benefit, U.S. diminished ability to mediate hurts in Israel, preemptive strikes, now existential threats, right? We're in the existential threat part of the world now. It used to be we would bomb them preemptively because we think they're threatening us. Now it's we bomb them preemptively because we think they're threatening us to exist, Right. Putin, existential existence. I'm going into Ukraine. Netanyahu. I mean, come on. I mean, it, if if the if the tragedy that occurred actually occurred from the Hamas um, terrorists, I would be existentially threatened as well. I don't know what would make me stop. You know. So so you have a you know a powder keg is what they said, but. Bibi's lighting fires. It's almost like Bibi is provoking uh, Iran to enter so it can retaliate. And, you know, we don't want that. We don't want that. All right, I'm Vince. Gold is down $15. Silver's down only 11 cents. See how that works? See, silver should be down more. That's really good news. I like that. And I want you to look at it this way. Silver and gold are down. There's going to be peace breaking out. No, no. Silver and gold are down. Uh, that's that's money getting out uh, that was like speculating on Friday. Well, look at crude. Crude's only down a dollar. That's not peace breaking out. That's a healthy retracement. Talk to you later. Well, thank you, Vince, as always, for this week's update and some insight into the large rally that we saw on Friday and what was actually happening there technically. Certainly some significant rallies we've seen over the past two weeks because, again, we had the rally the previous Friday, which was following the labor report with the headline numbers coming out stronger than expected and seeing somewhat surprising reversal in the metals. So again, another rally this past week, and we will get more insight into that and what actually happened between the funds and the banks when this Friday COT report is released. So hopefully you found that one helpful in terms of understanding what's going on there. Before we wrap up, would like to mention that for people who are in the market for silver and looking for something that is on sale, Miles Franklin is running a special on Silver Morgan Rounds for only $2.09 over spot. 
You can find out more about that by emailing Arcadia at milesfranklin.com, where you can get information about that or any of the things that we are discussing on the show. So if you do have questions or are in the market for silver, Arcadia at milesfranklin.com. And with that said, going to wrap up for today, but hope your week is off to a great start and I will look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. 